What's good, everybody, and welcome to a special episode of the What's Good Games podcast. Normally your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday, but today, the one and only Brittany Brombacher and me, Andrea Renee, are here today to talk about Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja's Rise of the Ronin. Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. dun. Disclaimer. Thank you so much to Sony Interactive Entertainment and PlayStation for providing us review copies of the game so that we could talk to you about it today. Brittany, you put out a fun little preview of the game, which I highly encourage everyone to go watch over on at Blonde Nerd on YouTube. We'll link that in the show notes down below where you give a really great overview about everything that is happening in Team Ninja's new action open world RPG a departure for Team Ninja, something a little different from them that we were both looking forward to playing. So I don't think we need to go over absolutely all of the features in the game, but I know you have a lengthy outline that you have prepared. Girl, we would be here hours if we went over everything this game is. Yes. So yeah, like you said, this is Team Ninja's latest and greatest, and I believe this game has been in development um, for about seven years now, I think is what I read in an interview. Um, they have said that this is their most challenging and ambitious project to date. You know, it's an open world narrative driven, your choices matter kind of game. And, you know, they're mostly known for Ninja Guide and Neo and most recently Will Long Fall Fallen Dynasty, which I really, really loved. Um, but yeah, this game is coming out March 22nd. And it's an interesting game to talk about because like you mentioned in my preview, I kind of talked about, I mean, just like a brief overview of like all of the features that are in this game. But as someone who knew from day one that I would be interested in playing this, I've kind of stayed away from all of the details and whatnot. So, because I wanted to be surprised, like, what's it? What is this game? I was not expecting this game to be what it is. And like you said, it's officially described as a combat focused open world action RPG. So, this game is set place in 19th century Japan, and these are the final years of the Edo period. And I'm going to hop over to Gaming Bolt, who accurately describe what this historical setting is because this entire game is rooted in history and fuck me if I'm going to be able to describe this with any form of like literacy so quote essentially it's an era characterized by its abandonment of feudal values instead replaced by the modern in pursuit of an empire factions were at war during this period the most notable of which the traditionalist shogunate forces and pro-imperial anti-shogunate nationalists there was growing resentment of the Western influence following the arrival of U.S. Navy Commodore Matthew Perry, who you see, and essentially the black ships have arrived, and you have people who are like, we need the foreigners here, we don't need the foreigners here, as you know, Japan was secluded for so long. Anyway, it's a fascinating setting for um, for a game, and actually, like a Dragon Ishin um, touched on this as well. But anyway, the, the story unfolds in Yokohama, and then Ito, and then Kyoto, and each one of these areas um, is its own little mini open world map. So... There's just a lot, a lot going on here. And what's interesting, too, is the choices you make in this game are going to impact the narrative. And that's kind of fascinating because it is so set in history. And now I have not finished the game yet, so I have yet to see how my choices I make play out and how they can impact this narrative, which is, again, supposedly rooted in history. So it'll be interesting to see if you can save people who have historically died. Heads up, I've gone down many rabbit holes. I find a character in this game I'm like, oh, what happened to them? And I actually spoil myself on some of it because it's all like, again, real people. Um, so you start out with this bomb ass character creator, which I'm sure everyone's seen a lot about. And you get to create two different characters. They can both be men or women or whatever you want. Um, and then the game pretty much kicks off. Some stuff goes down. And then before you know it, you're thrown into this open world. And you are exploring as a ronin. You are a, a masterless samurai. And what choices are you going to make? Who who are you going to align yourselves with? You have pro shogunate and then anti, and then that's all going to be pretty much the basis of what you do. Um, th this is kind of a con, though, in some ways, because there is so much history that this game is trying to cover that a lot of it feels like the narrative is disjointed um, because, you know, it's like... <laughs> And Grant, I will say this, like I've never played Ninja Gaiden, but Woe Long suffered from this as well, where the narrative just kind of like, what is happening? Who are these people? Why is everyone upset? And especially if you don't know a lot about the history of Japan, I think a lot of people are going to be a little confused. There is an encyclopedia option there. 
um, where you can learn a little bit more. And even then it doesn't do a fantastic job. So just keep that in mind. But I think it's all okay because the gameplay is so fantastic. And I only wanted to deep dive into that because again, this is like their first like real foray into super narrative driven games. I think for the most part they pull it off, but at, you know, they're trying to cover a lot in one game. I'm glad you brought that up. There's a lot of things that Team Ninja is doing great in this game, and there's definitely areas where it feels like they bit off a little bit more than they can chew. And narrative has never really been the thing that Team Ninja is known for. I think right. even their staunchest fans agree that we're here for the combat, we're not here for the deep character storytelling, right? And right. that's what we were, as fans, really looking forward to in Rise of the Ronin, seeing, oh, is this going to be a departure from them? But it might have been just too much of a departure in certain areas when it comes to storytelling specifically and some other areas that we'll get into later on. But, yeah, there is a lot in this game. It kind of feels a little bit like everything in the kitchen sink, sort yeah. of in the way that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth did, but in a very different way, right? Because clearly Square Enix and the Final Fantasy team has strengths in this kind of action, open world RPG type of gameplay where Team Ninja was really foraying into hit this for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what they are known for, speaking of that, is their combat, right? That yeah. That is what Team Ninja is known for. And I just want to say so many props and so many kudos to that team for offering three difficulty options. Oh, like, thank bless. you. Plus, the accessibility settings in this game actually Woo! made it playable for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I also started on the lowest difficulty, which I believe is called Dawn. And what's great about that is even if that is too tough, there are additional settings in the menu that you can go and tweak a little bit to make it an easier experience. But as I got the hang of it, and because this game is very, there is a lot of RPG to this game, I found myself severely overleveled and I was just like one hitting bitches left and right. So I did bump it up again the, to the next difficulty and that made the combat even more intense, obviously. And it was really fun. So I try to dabble in that difficulty as much as possible. But if I get to a point where I'm getting too frustrated, I will lower it. So we're not going to get too much in the weeds because there are a lot of systems at work here. And Do you want to talk about the combat systems now? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just going to mention one of the things that I think was really – that I was eager to see as somebody who doesn't spend a lot of time with Team Ninja games because they are too hard for me. I'm not afraid to admit that to y'all. You know, guys know that I'm not like a – like a souls born kind of person. And while there are some glimpses of souls inspired combat in this game, clearly the roots of what team Ninja does shines through in the combat. But as we've already discussed, it's a lot more approachable in rise of the Ronin than it has been in say like Neo, for example, or any of their other past titles. And I think that is a bridge for them to bring in potentially new fans. And yes. I didn't really enjoy how much you have to focus on parrying and dodging. That is a huge part of the combat. And if you are somebody like me that really struggles with patience in parrying, you're definitely going to struggle in this game too. So baby ass baby mode is going to be your friend. Or if you like doing those higher difficulties, you just got to learn the patterns and get good at the counter spark which is essentially the name for the parry system in this game and it's super rewarding and feels so fun when you get it but dang it feels bad when you die <laughs> it yeah no absolutely and that's something that i felt too when i first started um i have gotten the hang of it now though after about 30 hours in i got it so i have like it, when you get in that groove god it feels so good so you know you can um guard you can evade you have the counter spark you have your main attack button you have your special attacks and that is just kind of like the basic ass like combat right that you have to get your head around but then as you progress you're going to unlock different fighting styles and each fighting style is effective against certain weapons i believe it's weapons like in full disclosure i'm 30 hours into this i'm still trying to wrap my head around all of the systems i think i'm doing okay because i'm like yeah. winning a lot of my fights but i think a lot of the mechanics are just now really starting to um it's, click for me at its base it's a rock paper scissors combat exactly. system which we've seen in several other franchises and it does feel like it's taken a lot of influence from Ghost of Tsushima being a PlayStation title as well. And obviously the Japan setting, I mean, 
I'll get into some more of the parallels between those two games a little bit later on. But particularly for the combat with the stances, it definitely feels like more yeah. of a departure from what Team Ninja has done in the past and feels more like they're trying to adapt it to a different setting. And I feel like sometimes it felt really successful and other times it didn't. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. And maybe it's just because, you know, I've had a lot more time with it. But now it's... I mean, it's a lot when you're first starting, right? You're trying to manage because you have two different weapons that you can have at, at once, primary weapons, right? You have your katanas, your spears, your pole arms, your great swords, and then you can have the sub weapons, the sub secondary weapons like shurikens, bows, rifles. There's some other fun stuff you unlock. And so you're trying to like attack and dodge and counter spark and switch between your weapons and get like the hang of all of that and then they throw these fighting styles on you which requires you to um like hold another button down and then move the analog over like and you have to do it pretty quickly because you're going to come across many different enemies per skirmish so you can't just have one fighting style and not to mention every weapon you use plays differently has different move sets with it um they do have presets available if you're a hardcore motherfucker and you're like i want to do this on the hardest difficulty you can create your presets you can do all of that stuff so you'll yeah, have loadouts baby loadouts yeah for uh for whatever you whatever you encounter but again this is what the beautiful thing is is you can get in the weeds as you want with this as much as you want to or you can just put on baby ass baby mode do a lot of the the open world stuff where you're going to get a lot of XP. You're going to be very, very overleveled before you know it. And I really enjoy the open world stuff, and we'll talk about that soon. Um, and then, you know, encounters on easy mode are very, like, I'm not going to say very easy, but they're much more approachable. You can't button mash no matter what difficulty you're on um, and get away with it. You have to know when to strike. But once you get that, once it clicks for you, uh, it's, it's like second nature, and it's really good. Really, really fun. Uh, on top of all of that, you have skill trees. <laughs> so you have strength, dexterity, intelligence, and charisma skill trees. And, you know, without getting too in the weeds on this, you can do everything from upgrade your shurikens to, um, God, I don't know what else, can, oh, persuade people in conversations or intimidate people in conversations. There's just so much you can do here. And each little thing, each little icon in the skill tree can be leveled up generally multiple times. And it's a... <laughs> This is it's so much, Andrea. It's yes. So, I yes, feel like so, I feel like it's it doesn't so much. Yeah. It's, it doesn't sound like so much right now, but like I, when I'm talking about this and I'm like, okay, I have all these other things I have to talk about and we'll get there. But it's just like I feel like there's like all this like knowledge pushing against my brain like it's a dam and the dam's about to break and spooge you over everything. So I have a question for you in regards to where you're at in the story. And of course, you know, when it comes to narrative where this is a spoiler free conversation, as it always is. But one of the things that's really different for Team Ninja with Rise of the Ronin is the impact of narrative choices in the world. Mm -hmm. And clearly the choices that you make in regards to progression and upgrading those RPG elements are going to play into that as well. With where you're at, have some of the decisions that you've made earlier in the game had an impact or have you seen like the fruits of the outcomes of those decisions yet? Or do you think mm. you're still going to have to keep waiting? I think I'm going to have to keep waiting. So here's the thing. Despite being 30 hours in, I only just wrapped up the first section. So there's those three different areas I talked about. I just wrapped up the first one. And I'm pretty sure this game is going to take place across multiple years. Again, I haven't experienced that myself yet. Um, because I did everything in the open in the first section of the open world. Absolutely everything. And I, again, like not knowing a hell of a lot about this game before I hopped in it, all I knew is I wanted to play it. I did not realize that it was as massive as uh, it is. And had I known that, I probably would have paced that out a little better. But I have done things that I know will have some sort of narrative impact. But what that is yet, I don't know. Don't yeah, I, so I've made a couple key choices even in the early game specifically because I want to see how they're going to play out. And I have seen like a tidbit of how one of those choices is going to play out. Like once I get to a, like a, a different section of the map, it's like, oh, I remember that thing from that place and why I made that choice. It looks like over on this section of the map, I'm going to be able to like see what the the outcome of that choice that I made, which I think is really interesting. But mm -hmm. it makes me slightly concerned that this game, while very fun and jam-packed with stuff to do, does a lot 
just okay and does very little really well. And I'm concerned the more time I put into it, the more I'm going to feel like, oh, this one part of the game is fun, but it feels like the side-by-side -side comparison of Rise of the Ronin stacked against even just the other PlayStation 5 console exclusives of the same genre just isn't kind of meeting them where they're at. And I don't know if I'm going to be compelled to keep coming back to this game. But if there was like a hook later, like down the line, that's like, oh no, hang in there. Because we all know these big open world action RPGs, they're, it's almost like clockwork that you get people who have early access saying, yeah, the first couple of hours are kind of like wah wah, but just hang in there until you get to like hour 20 and then we promise it gets better. <laughs> and that feels like a really tough challenge for a lot of gamers these days when there's so much to play. Yeah, and I will say the opening of Rise of the Ronin did not do anything for me. Like, I mean, the, it was the actively were bad dry. for me. I was, I was upset. <laughs> Some of it the was, writing was real bad. <laughs> it was a desert in the in the undergarments for me. It was not good. Um, but then as soon as I kind of stepped out and wrapped my head around all of the mechanics, and I want to go back to what you said earlier. See, I think they do a lot of things well, but they don't do anything exceptional minus the combat. And I think that's why I'm still playing. And again, everyone is wired differently, right? The narrative is usually the thing that keeps me going. That is like my bread and butter. The narrative in this is interesting. And as someone who is just like inherently fascinated and, and I love Japanese culture and its history and whatnot, I think that keeps me hooked too. But I think it's the combat and the open world exploration and just the kind of the chill vibes I get from it, I think is hit in a particular spot for me right now, which is why I keep going back. Um, now, now that I'm like in my second open world area though, I'm going to be curious to know, like, is it still going to have that same effect on me? Because I just did this in another map and I thought I was done with it and that felt really good. But now that there's this whole new map and another map after that, am I going to have to do the same thing over and over and over again? And how is that going to feel by the time I roll credits? And that like remains to be seen. Um, but speaking of the open world, cause we haven't really talked about that too much, um, so again, like three different areas and they're a, a decently good sized map. And that's where a lot of my time has gone so far. You traverse by foot, by grappling hook, by horse, by a glider. I will say the horse has an auto run feature. Um, I found that my horse is very stupid. It's and so it, hilariously bad. Uh, girl, I just, I have to say it. The fair. horse <laughs> animation and moving through the open world is comically bad. To the point that you'll just like, it, it reminded me of Skyrim Jank, but this is a <laughs> PlayStation 5 exclusive game, not a PlayStation 3 game. And I think that's where I just like, I'm having a hard time like accepting accepting it, but I still get on my, my jankity old steed and we run around and clip through rocks and up hills <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. I've tried using the auto run and like this one time it got stuck on this like little root that was in the pathway and so it like turned around and started going the other way and then it just stopped. I was like what are you doing my horsey? So I uh, will not be winning horsey of the year for me although I do kind of appreciate that it's it's kind of silly and stupid. Um, and for the most part I will say the traversal is fine. I have and had some issues with it even in my preview. Um, I had an, an initial issue with the grappling hook. I felt like it wasn't very sticky in the sense that like, I could see a rooftop that I wanted to get to. And I would even have the icon that I could grapple to it and just like it wouldn't work. That was probably user error. So I will go back on that saying that was probably my bad. But the issue I still have with it is that there are times where I will, where I will come across maybe waist high rocks. And I'm like, I should be able to jump off of these rocks and go over this like ledge. But you can't. Or, it, or it's just exceedingly difficult for no reason to get from point A to point B, especially if you're doing a little bit of platforming and there's no rope to guide you. It's just sometimes frustrating. Um, not to mention that the initial, and I've kind of gotten more used to it now, but it's not, eh, to run and sprint is circle, to jump is X. Why they didn't make it so sprint is clicking the left stick and said they assigned crouch to that, I don't know. Because it's, if you're trying to, it's, it's maddening. It it's is maddening. It is. The button the worst layout part, for this game. And as you said in your preview, you can remap some of it, but then you're overlapping certain key button in pr yes. uh, presses. And like, I think as a game that's been designed for the PlayStation 5, published by Sony, this to me is a huge misstep on the part of Sony Interactive for not stepping in and saying, hey, Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja, we're partnering with you guys to publish this as a PS5 exclusive. 
we absolutely need our engineering team to work with you guys on like the button mapping with the dual sense like that to me is like a big mistake on their part and i'm disappointed especially when this game is coming out between final fantasy 7 rebirth and you know dragon's dogma 2 two other massive rpgs you know that i mean i haven't played yeah. dragon's dogma 2 yet but like final fantasy is like an impossible bar for horizon <laughs> Ronin to meet right yeah boy yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, it it really is, and you and you can remap, but you it doesn't work. It just won't work with the way everything is configured. So, it's just a it's a it's an interesting choice, and like you said, one that I don't know how that happened. I kind of hope they patch a fix for it because it would just make it a lot more enjoyable. Uh, but other than that, like when you're traversing and when it works, it's I like this open world because I don't feel like it's super stuffed with too much to do, and I just get in that open world chill vibe mindset when I'm playing this and. You know, just you, I got a lot going on in my personal life right now, and it's just really been a light for me just to be able to run around and pet cats and, like, you know, go to shrines and find treasure chests and, and defeat fugitives. And so those are just some of the things that you can do in this open world. There are chance encounters where you can find people that maybe you need to save or whatnot. Um, public orders are essentially, you know, villages you have to liberate or strongholds or whatnot. Um, photographs to take there's dojos horseback archery artillery training like there is just so much to do but it doesn't feel overstuffed so that's what i like about it and that's why i spent all my time doing it in the first section and you get xp for it you get rewards for it um, another way of fast travel um the only way of fast travel actually like literal fast travel is veiled edge banners and these are banners that you're going to find scattered throughout the map um there's lots of them and these will replenish your consumable items it works that way a lot we know with you know souls like games and in will long that's how it works it will respawn enemies and it also turns your karma which is a different type of xp into skill points as well uh so you know they're it's easy peasy nothing super like you know brand new and exciting here but those are there too and that's what you'll be using um go ahead I hear oh you. no i was just going to mention that you know, the open world, certain areas are more dense than others. I was, you know, nothing here is is out of the ordinary or innovative. Like, again, I think, right. you know, my time with the open world so far is like, oh, it's not bad. You know, it's, you know, it's pretty standard and, and feels like a bunch of visuals and things I've seen before. But nothing e either stands out. I mean, obviously, like, as a cat lover, I love that you can pick up the cats and pet them. But, you know, unfortunately, Team Ninja is not the first game to do, to do this at this point. <laughs> but I love that they included that. Um, but I think it's important what you mentioned, why you're really vibing with it, because it feels chill. And I think some people who want that vibe will appreciate that there isn't a bunch of stuff. But I also want to, like, you know, juxtapose that with this, again, this standard, which I feel has been set for these types of games, that there's a lot of things that narratively impact the overall storytelling arc, but also feel like the gameplay mechanics have a progression built in. So you're not just going to pick up things for the sake of picking them up. And you do see, you know, like you can pick up credits or you can find gear and things like that. But, you know, I think not until later on in the game will any of that really feel like it has like a substantial impact. Because I've skipped a lot of the open world stuff and haven't really felt too underpowered but that could also be tied mm -hmm. to my difficulty setting so potentially if you're playing on those harder difficulties that those side activities may become much more crucial and important and yeah there is another motivator i'm glad you brought that up uh for me anyway after so each the map is broken up into different regions let's just call them regions and it has a check each region has a checklist of stuff that there is to do in that area and once you complete that checklist you get like maybe two or three skill points or some good items or something like that. So you do get rewarded in the end for doing all of those things. And for me, it's just like an enticing little carrot at the end of it. I'm like, yeah, I'll do all this because look at my reward. And then, like I said, I was like, girl, I was going into fights like 13 levels ahead of like everything around me. And I was like, okay, I am a god. Look at me roar. <laughs> but that, um, feel, yeah. that feels good, though, when the oh, world so scales good. in that way. I prefer that that the time that i've sunk grinding in the open world and collecting all the things then makes me feel like a god that's what i want right and then if i don't want to spend the time doing it then it feels you know the balance is a little bit different but when everything scales up with you it it feels frustrating <laughs> like don't i hate do that, that. <laughs> like i'm grinding because i want to be powerful god damn it yeah um yeah, so you mentioned treasure chests and i feel like we need to talk about the inventory in this game because i don't know about you but i am drowning 
drowning in gear in weapons and items and crafting items there's so much literally friends the inventory max limit like the amount of items you can have in your inventory is maxed out at what like two thousand two thousand items yeah yes it's, and I it's a lot that. Well, it's it's interesting the way that they've managed inventory because when you you can hold a certain amount of items like on your person of a specific item. So let's say you have like the the red berries and like the poison whetstones, right? So of each of those things, you can hold like five red berries and like three whetstones. Those numbers aren't accurate. I'm just trying to illustrate a picture for everybody who's listening and watching. So you can have like of the berries and whetstones, you could have 2,000 objects, and then each of the individual objects has its own individual limit as well. And then you, everything else goes into your storage, and then you can access and pull things from your storage. And when you're crafting, it pulls items from your storage first Thank instead God. of from the ones you're holding on your person, which is a really nice touch. I also, Britt, I don't know if you did this. I went through a bunch of the settings before I started my playthrough, and you know every time I'm going to toggle on auto pickup. There's an auto I pickup didn't. toggle. It's on. And it got to the point where I was like, I forgot how much gear I was picking up because I wasn't technically picking anything up. <laughs> I was just like oh, Hoover no. vacuuming everything from everybody <laughs> I, I was coming into contact with. So I would go to vendors and I would open up my inventory and be like, holy shit, I have 40 new weapons in there that I haven't even looked at yet. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a lot of gear and you get a lot of it quickly, but unfortunately a lot of it also feels disposable particularly in early game until you really figure out what kind of play style you want i do appreciate that they brought in the set bonus this is something we've seen in several Mm -hmm. other rpgs i as a collector trash panda girl over here love to do a set bonus but you know it takes a lot of you know trash panda eating to find all that stuff but (laughs) it definitely feels like team ninja as a studio took some of the things that they've done in their previous games in regards to the impact of gear on combat specifically and brought that into Rise of the Ronin, but also Mm -hmm. sprinkled a little bit more on top, which is, you know, if you've played Team Ninja games, you know that they're not stingy with loot. (laughs) Like, you know, you get a lot and you have to absolutely manage a lot of gear here, but you can break it down or you can sell it. So, you know, just just get rid of it. Just clear it out and trust me, you'll get more. (laughs) Yep, just break it at, break it down. You can upgrade your weapons if you want. If you find something that you really love and you want to ride or die for, just break those little bitch ass things down and add them on. There is an awesome transmog system. So yes, transmog, you, and it starts early too. God it bless does. a transmog that unlocks within the first five hours. Oh, it's so great. So no matter if you have the weapons in your inventory or not, as long as you acquire them once, you can access them in the transmog system whenever you want. I personally, I love looking goofy, and I look goofy all the time in this game. I think it is so funny. I have, like, this Western hat on with, like, this traditional kimono and, like, these, like, white tennis shoes on. I was going to ask if you're wearing one of the top hats. (laughs) Absolutely. I love me a good top hat. It is so funny, too, because my character is so damn hot. I made her so distractingly hot. But, like, I can't take her seriously when she's wearing, like, a silly little top hat and a kimono. But it's fine. Um, it's really, it's a really fun system. And there's a lot of gear there. And, you know, I will say that it can be a lot of maintenance. Um, if you did play Woe Long, it's, it's a little bit better this time around. I will say, like, they've improved it. And there is a bond transfer system, which means that, I think it's called bond transfer. Whatever. You can, if you find a weapon you like, you can modify it and customize it as long as you have the weapon that you want to like steal stats and attributes from. So again, like you can get really in the weeds with this or you don't have to. And I do want to applaud them on that. I think that's great that they've made these systems. Like I haven't touched the bond system. No need for me to do that, but it's there. If you want to be a badass, it's there for you. Um, Andrea, have you unlocked the long house yet? Yes, I have. <laughs> oh, here's another whole ass thing you can do. Oh, I can decorate my house in a, in a team ninja game. What's happening? <laughs> you it's it's wild yeah so you have this long house and it's a base essentially and i think you're gonna unlock multiple throughout the game but at this one in particular yes you can lightly remodel and what this will do it'll give you certain stat buffs certain drop increases and depending on what sort of things you hang um some of your allies are going to come visit you we haven't even talked about the bond and friendship levels and all of that but that's a whole nother thing i mean and like there's spring like i haven't seen it yet but they're like sprinkling hints of romance options potentially in this as well you can give your friends gifts you know it reminded me almost of the bioware team system like the squad mate system Mm -hmm. where you you know meet people in the world do then you do 
missions with them because all of the missions are standalone missions. They're not just natively in the open world. You kind of really have to go to them and then you launch a separate menu. And I think they did that to facilitate multiplayer because there is co-op available for the missions in this game. Now, you can't traverse the open world co-op but you can do the missions co-op. It almost reminds me a bit of how, again, Ghost of Tsushima and Sucker Punch did it, but the co-op stuff in Ghost of Tsushima is obviously oh. its own standalone mode and Phenomenal. not within the main game. And so yeah. it's it's interesting. So I think that it feels like it's set up that way so that you can have these AI companions, which I always like having a buddy around. You know, sometimes it can yeah. be a little solitary, you know, <laughs> like clipping through rocks on your horsey by yourself. <laughs> No one there to appreciate what just happened. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I mean, I do like you, you give presents to your friends and each one has their own preference and uh, you can increase your bond level with them and unlock new interesting dialogue options, which again, like to talk about, these are real people that existed in history, right? And I didn't quite put two and two together until I was like, this name sounds familiar. I don't remember which one it was, but I Googled it, and then before I knew it, I had gone down a rabbit hole, Andrew. I spent like two hours Googling every NPC I had come across in the encyclopedia in the game, reading about what they did, what their role was, you know, how they lived, how they died, who they were banging, how many kids they had. I was like, oh, my God. And then when you see them in game, you're like, ah. So you have these conversations with them, and obviously, like, Team Ninja has done their due diligence in trying to make these people, obviously, like, as authentic to their real selves as possible. But, you know, if you're a history buff, I think you're really going to get off on this. And if you're into Japanese history as well, I think you'll really get off on this as well. Um, you can also send out the cats that you collect. I don't know if you've gotten, you've gotten to that point yet, Andrew. Maybe, maybe no, not. I haven't. Oh, I've just yes. Been, I've just been petting them all, like, the good okay, little yeah. kitties that that's, they are. That's great. Yep. Yeah, the cats. Uh, you collect the cats. You can send them on missions. That's a thing you can do sure from, why not from your longhouse you have dogs that will do and run errands and then you'll while you're playing you'll see other players dogs come into your game and you'll pet them and you'll get silver marks for them which is like a, another form of currency like i mean it is just unreal i feel like this game has a little bit of everything in it and that's why it is it's, it's hard to like wrap my head around and, and really talk about it in a concise streamlined way because there's just so much you can do um but i you know i will say this like i am enjoying my time with it it's not it is a good ass video game and i think games like this i'm happy it exists is it a naughty dog is it a, a sucker punch experience is it an insomniac experience like in terms of polish and and budget and all that like no but it doesn't need to be and i think that's something that we as gamers really need to come to terms with and realize that not every game has to be this gorgeous, stunning, beautiful, perfectly running narrative, whatever the fuck, to be a success. And this game has a little jank. It's a little rough around the edges. I have some issues with its storytelling, but this game is fun to play. And I think, you know, as someone who's supposed to criticize games and talk about whatever, I just really want to drive that point home. It's not perfect, but fuck, it's fun to play. And I think we've just kind of lost that along the way when it comes to, you know, picking games apart or comparing them from one game to another game, it can be its own thing. And this game is its own thing, and I'm really having a great time with it. I, I love that you're it. having a blast with it, and I think it's important. And I mean, you and I have brought that up on, you know, multiple occasions in our show and with games that are fun but maybe not, you know, the perfect game or maybe not like a game of the year potential game. And I absolutely agree that this game is fun fun but I feel compelled to point out some of the technical problems that I've had because sure. you know even though this is not in you know it, from Insomniac Games or from Naughty Dog as you'd mentioned this is a PlayStation 5 exclusive and it does cost real world dollars and there are other games out there that you could be potentially be spending those dollars on and I want to just mention that I had some substantial problems with uh, frame rate loss. So there's a couple of different mm -hmm. performance modes in this game, the standard prioritize frame rate, FPS, or you can prioritize graphics. I always prioritize graphics because I usually play on baby ass baby mode. So the frame rate's not as important to me, but particularly in a game that is about combat, a Team Ninja game where frame rate is incredibly important, especially with the parry and dodge system, and being able to accurately read and time everything, like the combat loop hinges on the parrying system. I was disappointed that they seem to be really struggling to maintain 
frame rate in both modes because I've tried it both directions and I didn't see like a noticeable improvement one way or the other in either mode. And so that's concerning. Wow. I do want to point out that Sony did tell us that there's going to be a day one patch. Now we are playing pre the day one patch. So it's very important that I point that out. We don't exactly know what the day one patch is going to do specifically because they gave us high level bullet points of what the patch is going to be, but obviously once the patch is out and it's actually applied, I would suggest that people who are particularly interested in that data go to, you know, industry standard outlets like Digital Foundry and watch their, you know, technical breakdown of how this game actually performs because clearly what's good games is not that outlet. So I want to make sure to point that out. I also have a lot of problems with texture popping in the open world. Now we made some jokes about the jank in this game, but it's persistent. And so I think it's important to point that out. You're absolutely right, Brittany, that this game does not need to meet the visual bar that other games in the genre have, but I think it definitely isn't pushing it as far as it could for the hardware that it's on. We know that the PlayStation 5 is an incredible machine. I mean, look at what we got with Marvel Spider-Man 2. Look at what we got with, you know, The Last of Us Part 2. But this game isn't even coming close to what those games meet. And it's so tough. I think the real problem is that, like you just played, Like a Dragon, Ishin was not that long ago. And that game looked gorgeous. And then mm -hmm. even Ghost of Tsushima, which was a PlayStation 4 game, you know, doesn't, this game doesn't hold a candle to the, the gorgeous graphics of what Sucker Punch did in that game in that game so i think it's important for people to like come in with the right expectations that if you're going to put money into this game that first off you should probably be a fan of team ninja and appreciate what they're doing with the combat because that's a huge part of this game mm -hmm. but just keep in mind that like britney said you're gonna have a blast doing a lot of this content but it's not going to meet the visual or performance bar that's been set by other games in the genre on playstation 5. Yeah, I think those are the the right little disclaimers I would give as well. Just be prepared for, I mean, the story is, yeah, it is what it is what you talked about. It's not the most go gorgeous game. I haven't had a lot of uh, frame issues. I, I only play on performance mode. I never play on graphics mode because I, I don't know. It's my thing. We're opposite in that way. Um, I haven't had too many issues with that. And the texture pop-ins have not been to the point of distracting for me. But I think it's important to point that out if you are someone who cares about like, that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think those are all fair disclaimers. And yeah, I think like it really drove home for me, like the struggle that Team Ninja was having with the graphics when I found myself on a cliffside, clearly in an area that I probably shouldn't have been in quite yet. And I was like, <laughs> I wonder what will happen if I just jump off into the water below. Oh, the intrusive thoughts got you, huh? <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, like you do, I saved right before I, I did this experiment, but I, I safely landed in the water below. So it turns out you can jump from high places into water and not get fall damage or not that hey. much fall damage, but you can swim in this game, but boy, oh boy, you don't want to dive. There is nothing down there but blank textures. And in my oh. mind, I was like, why even make that a thing that you can do, like dive specifically? Like, you know, do the little, uh, you know, like, what's it called, like the breaststroke at the, at the surface of the water as you're going across. But the idea that you're gonna allow the character player character to dive underwater, but then you're not gonna fill it with any art was just such a, was such a head scratcher for me of like, why, why waste development resources on that when you could have put it into clearly making more cat activities in the game? <laughs> I think the only thing I found underwater are shells and some random collectibles. I think that's it. I have not paid attention to the lack of textures. I think I've only dived maybe three times in this game. So yeah, I don't, tell is what you I'm saying. Under. Don't waste your don't. time diving. I think in this another game. thing I, I want to bring up too um, that I think I've gotten used to and accepted, but it was a little off putting at first was you have your main character, right? And you can spend fuck, hours doing this character. I mean, there's a lot of options there. I don't think it's as intense as Dragon's Dogma, but it's like really good. Anyway, so you have this character and you can choose their voice and the pitch of their voice and whatnot. The main character isn't very active in the sense that they don't do a lot of actual speaking. There's a lot of grunting going on, a lot of like screaming if you get impaled, especially. But as far as like conversational and whatnot, there's not a lot there. And I'm and I'm kind of bummed about that. And I think when you're having conversations with NPCs, it's mostly fo the camera's mostly focused on the NPC. It doesn't really flip over to the main character. Um, 
you know, Baldur's Gate is a great example of the game where you don't have a voice protagonist, but I still felt very, very connected to my character, right? I don't feel connected to this character much, if at all. And I, and I think maybe that's because the dialogue options more or less are kind of bland when you're making a decision as the character. There's just not a lot of camera time on the character. Um, I don't know what it is. It hasn't really improved for me, but I would also just... You know, don't expect to fall in love with your main character is what I'm saying. You'll, I think you'll fall in love with some of the NPCs. I think a lot of them are very eccentric and funny and silly. And um, there's a lot of laugh out loud moments for me. But uh, yeah, your main character is kind of like a, eh, they're fine. They're fine. I'm not very like, I'm not convinced of their convictions yet. Yes. I think that just plays into what we were saying that this studio's, one of their known weaknesses is character development and storytelling. And there's... <laughs> There's certainly no shortage of like what the fuck moments that happen in this game that are really hilarious because they're so bad. Um, so go into it with like an open mind of like this isn't like a serious storytelling, which is a little again, like it just feels so conflicted. I think that's yeah. why I keep going back to with this game. And I think it's important that, you know, you I, I also love that you and I are doing this together because you remind me that sometimes I take the game just like a little too seriously. And it's like, it's okay for it to be like dumb fun, but it's tough when the game is almost setting you up to take it seriously. It's like, it, it's in this really intense era of Japanese history and they bring in all these real world historical figures and they have these big set pieces. And then it's like, but now a guy is gonna sell you weird whetstones in his underwear. Like I literally took a screenshot of one of the vendors who's just, <laughs> in underwear and like a top knot and i'm like what's did you did, what's happening here exactly <laughs> yeah again like the narrative is probably and i think and this is like the thing that i kind of wish i understand this is an exciting um time period it's a fascinating time period in the history of japan but it's a lot to tackle especially if you're not super familiar with telling a story driven narrative game i think this would be difficult for anybody to do right um so i kind of wish that they had maybe just focused on a specific maybe narrative arc or something in this period and i think that would have been easier because yeah like you said there are these moments it's set up to be serious this is a serious time but then you'll be here one moment and then the next moment you're somewhere else and someone's yelling at you and you don't know why they're yelling at you also how did you get here what and then they'll show like the conclusion to that whole like time period with like a five second cut scene that has little to no impact on the player because you didn't really get to thoroughly explore that plot point, right? Because they're trying to usher you along to, along with the history. But again, like this isn't, you know, we've said this before during it, just just take that with a grain of salt. I think, you know, yeah, they don't need to kick a dead, a dead uh, janky ass horse here. But. <laughs> janky horse. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot here to play. There's a lot here to have a great time with, but there's also a lot to be critical of. So it's a very mixed bag for me. Huge mixed bag. I, I do think what's exciting about this, though, that I want to drive home is that it shows that Team Ninja as a studio has the ability to take their tried and true formula and bring it to a wider audience. Now, how their diehard fans who were looking for more of a combat focused experience are going to feel about it, I think, remains to be seen. We'll definitely have to keep an eye on how the Internet reacts to this. I think Very it could curious. go both ways, honestly. I think that they could bring a bunch of new people into the fold to be like, wow, there's somebody out here who's doing a different take on the Souls formula, and then all the Teen Ninja fans are like, they were doing it for a long time. <laughs> um, you know, I know that it's, it's such a crutch for a lot of people to just to fall back on from software, but it's also impossible to ignore them because they've set themselves apart in the space. And I really hope that Team Ninja and Koi Tecmo look at – the response to this game and say, hey, what can we streamline, edit maybe out of the next adventure of this type and focus more on a couple key systems and not put everything in the kitchen sink in the game? Yeah. I'm excited to see what they do going forward. I mean, this is cool. I, again, like, I think I'm a little more hot, more hot on this game than you are. So for me, this is a really great next step for them. I hope they continue to get good at their craft. Um, whatever that is, are they going to make more like Ninja Gaiden-esque, Wolong-esque combat-focused games and maybe some more like this on the side? I hope so. I think that would be great. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and 
go back to like the combat real quick. A lot of the missions are combat focused. So if you are someone who's like, I just love the combat of Teen Ninja games. Good news. A lot of the story missions you do and pretty much every mission you do, you're not going to be picking berries for someone in this game. You're going to be like trying to be stealthy, trying to assassinate people, come up with millions of different ways to kill people in this game. Um, slice them with your sword, shoot them with a rifle, live your best life. You Ronin, you go on with your bad self. Uh, so yeah, there is that hook for people too. But yeah, with all the extra stuff around it, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a mixed bag. I'm very excited to see what the reaction is from, like you said, those diehard fans. We can sit back, grab the popcorn, and watch. Yeah. I think there's going to be, like, like I think it's going to be both sides. I think, like, the middle yeah. ground is going to be not a lot. I think there's going to be people who are like, it's bad, it sucks, and other people are going to be like, it's the best game ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just make your main character super hot like I do, and it just yeah. makes everything better. The makeup options alone. Oh. You know I gave my Ronin, like, really big wispy eyelashes she's got like a oh, full absolutely. face of makeup on because she can't go around yeah. cutting heads off of people without no, her lips on you know oh no no is that blood or is that lipstick who knows that's who part of her say? her allure <laughs> column a column b <laughs> <laughs> love it awesome well Britt, thanks for jumping on to chat with me about rise of the ronin and thank you again to playstation and sony interactive for providing us with coffee so that we could bring our thoughts to you if you guys are into Team Ninja games, if you're excited about this, or if you played by the time you watch this video, let us know in the comments below what you thought about it, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody.